Welcome to Soul Night Live number 59. Today, my guest is Roger Joseph Manning Jr. Hey, Roger. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you again. Yeah, sorry to keep you waiting. Gosh, it's been about six months since we talked. Um, what's been up in the meantime besides volume two? Well, uh, you know, just uh, navigating um, employment, politics, family, Christmas, COVID, like everybody else. Yeah. Um, and uh, doing my best. Um, I've been very thankful that my attention's been pulled into uh, what I call a healthy distraction <laughs> uh, in being able to give new music to the audience, trying to expand that audience and um, doing our best to continue to learn how to be more self-reliant, independent, um, without a, you know, any kind of major label or record company, tr traditional record company model. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just uh, figuring it all out. And, you know, every time it gets overwhelming, um, the, the fan response that has been generally so positive and supportive just makes all the difference. It just really reminds you that, yes, while it feels good to be able to make the time to realize your own music that you love. Uh, it's, it's just as impactful, just as important that, that full circle when you, you know, some stranger tells you that the song is changing their life kind of thing. You know? Sure. And that's um, that never gets old. And, and if anything, it uh, gives you the inspiration and your, your second win to keep working on the next project and the next project after that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, um, it's good to see you. And I, I hope the second one has been as popular as the first one. Yeah. So far, people are loving it. I mean, it's very, uh, it's very different. Um, well, not incredibly different, but I mean, uh, we definitely explored some territory that we hadn't before. Um, and the 30 people will be like that as well. So, but people, I think, uh, welcome that from us. They like that we're not just one thing all the time. Sure. Well, I think once this is done, it's going to, you know, you put them all three together, it's going to be a very diverse record as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. You know, That's so the plan. Covers a lot of ground. But yeah, the second one is definitely different than the first one. I mean, it's the same great quality, but musically and stylistically, it definitely goes some new places. And I was looking to talk a bit about that in detail here in a few minutes. Um, you had mentioned that, you know, part of your, I guess, your, your patron program is you can have the licorice quartet record a song or a cover tune i was wondering if anybody took you up on that and like what tunes you've covered so far uh, yeah one of our gosh most uh, loyal and supportive fans over the years um kent scully and his family he reached out uh to um have us do uh a roy wood cover oh really okay any old time will do okay um, was that and uh we all knew the song, um, certainly Roy Wood fans, but, uh, you know, none of us really sat down and dissected arrangements and production to, the, to that degree. Sure. Uh, so that was really fun to spend time with that song and figure out what a licorice quartet arrangement might look like. Okay. Um, we've done some other songs that were not covers, but people have brought us original material okay that were basically in demo form or something you know you know like hey i wrote this song years ago i love it never got around to finishing it you know can we enter an agreement and you guys take it from here kind of thing um we've done several of those and they're every every one of those projects is different and brings different set of challenges and rewards and uh i think it's been great that the public has trusted us enough to take a chance like that and you know this is not this is new for us too so we just kind of all dive in and stay in touch with the uh fan and, and see you know what what are they looking for and how can we make it happen and does this all make sense so sure cool and then when they give you a demo is it basically like you just kind of figure out the chords from the demo and then start fresh or do you build yeah. up and they already started yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, some stuff is a little more fleshed out than others. Um, and we just kind of jump in and start uh, 
breaking it down and figuring out what our strategy is. And we stay in touch with the uh, artist and original author and uh, just try to make sure, you know, and some guys are like, well, I really always, I always imagined this kind of thing. And other people are like, I have no idea. Go for it. I trust you do whatever you're hearing. Uh, so it's, it's all over the map. Very cool. Very cool. I may have to yeah. take you up on that before long. I'm, hey. I made a new year's resolution to record a new <laughs> song every week. And that's amazing. So, so good. Last week I did one that sounds like <coughs> Niall Rogers jamming with King Crimson. I love that combination. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I just kind of let the song lead me there. You know, I had like one part and I just kind of got it rolling and the rest just kind of fell out. Yeah. You know? I like it when that it's almost like painting, you know, you're just in there and you're like, well, I don't know what the rest of this picture is going to be right. like yet, but let me throw right. some orange on here and see what happens. You know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you had mentioned, I think, before that you're also working on a little bit of solo stuff on the side. Are you still kind of compiling for a eventual yeah, solo album? That's correct. I mean, I, I haven't stopped. Uh, I always have some songs in the work, and I have the next solo EP um, in the works as we speak. Uh, that'll most likely be what um, I put out there next while we, <laughs> you know, while we work away uh, figuring out how to complete licorice quartet's third ep because you have to remember all the licorice quartet songs at least the ones we set out to record uh in 2017 18 19 we laid the foundations for all of them you know most of the most of the band stuff all three eps all yeah volumes so yeah. Okay. all the songs we all we already know where they're headed and what the goal is it's just a matter of having the time and infrastructure to do that and then you throw long distancing into the mix with COVID. I mean, Eric and I both live in LA, but we can't get together and work. Right, I mean, we could, but it wouldn't here. be very smart. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's whether we're, we're, we're gathered around a mic singing background vocals together. Uh, that's not particularly uh, uh, savvy. So, um, uh, and Tim, of course, is in Georgia. Um, so we did this whole second EP, the, the completing it and mixing it. That was all done long distance, uh, which really slowed the process down. It was very, very frustrating, very challenging. Now, the upside was to be able to take inventory on the music on your own home studio speaker system, because whether you have high quality speakers or not, everybody knows their speakers, everybody trusts their speakers. Sure. They know when some, something sounds good and when it doesn't. So that, that was an, uh, an, an advantage, uh, whether we were discussing a guitar part together or a vocal idea or critiquing a mix that we were doing long distance with, with Ken Sluter, uh, who mixed our last EP. Um, you're able to listen on your own speakers. And so you can comment really intelligently about things, but you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty, I mean, running a band uh, democratically, very few artists can pull that off successfully. And of course, what I mean by that is, whether you're talking about the bass part, the guitar part, a lead vocal, a small little keyboard over it up. If everybody's take, taking a vote on it, you're going to be there all day. Yeah, just ask yes. They ran, well, exactly. They ran Bill Bruford off doing that, you know? Well, it's like, yeah, Tales from exactly. Topographic Oceans, I'm out of here. <laughs> I got yeah, nothing. And, to... and, you know, you can, certainly <laughs> being a musician in your own band, whatever level, you can sympathize. Sure. And you know how, how challenging it is just to get to the finish line, if you guys are preparing a cover song for a live right. show or something, you know? It is, although the democratic way, in the end, everybody seems happiest. It may take a little longer, but at least everybody got their, their set. Well, that, uh, exactly. And, and that's, it's a, um, you know, it's a more uh, compassionate, um, communal way of getting to the finish line but you have to, it just requires such wisdom. And I'm not saying I've mastered anything, but you have to, you have to be very aware of when the gem of the idea is risking being watered down because you're trying to please everyone. Well, that, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, you know, people kind of barter and trade almost like, yes. Okay. I'll let this slide for the sake of your thing. But then somebody's not quite happy because it is getting diluted, you know. It's getting diluted, and and uh, yeah, I think it was Todd Rundgren that was 
reading an interview about, but he was talking about, he goes, he goes, that's one of the reasons I do so many different things and I enjoy so many different things, whether it's producing or having the Utopia band or my own solo stuff is because I have a different role in all those groups. And um, with my solo stuff, it's, it's me unedited. I'm not answering to anybody but myself and nobody's trying to filter me. You know, I mean, occasionally the record company is if they're poking you in the back going, got to get, got to get on the radio, man. If you're not going to, if you're not going to make this happen, don't know if you're going to have a record deal next year, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I've always enjoyed hearing and you can hear, and you can hear on Utopia more of the personalities coming in, certainly as the, as Utopia evolves you sure. know, to the four people mm-hmm. um, that became the core band. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just all, it's all terribly fascinating. And cert- certainly we, we, we know albums where some of our favorite lead singers went solo or there's a solo effort, but, and there can be plenty of, moments of genius but you're it's almost you're longing for what the group sound was as good as the solo sound is as well sure so um it's uh i think we've gotten quite good at it because since we're all songwriters who've worked independently on our own stuff i think we're all very well aware of when it's veered so off course that it's not the original idea anymore. And we should have a discussion about that. We should take inventory. We should maybe no longer entertain that idea and move on to another one, you know, whatever the case may be. Sure. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm excited to see what you come up with. Um, Now, when you do the solo stuff, do you play everything yourself on, on the records or do you? Uh, Whatever it takes. If I feel I can get it done uh, most efficiently, quickly uh, with the least stress, I'll attempt it myself. Um, it might be quicker to call up a guitarist friend who I think would be perfect for this idea or, you know, wh- whatever it is. I don't, I'm not precious about that. Um, uh, but the solo stuff is primarily me. If it, if it wasn't, if there, <laughs> if there was a bunch of people on there, we just end up being another group project. Another band of some sort. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. Okay. Very cool. Um, so let's see. Um, so it looked like I saw you in a in front of a green screen the other day uh, working on a video. Uh, I'm guessing you guys have chosen one of the four songs to do a video for. Can you tell me a bit about it? Well, it should be out now. Yeah, it's the um, actually I believe it's coming out sometime next week. But there's a teaser about to drop. It's it's for the dream that took me over. Excellent. The third Super song on the EP. Etchy earworm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, we decided. You know, it's, it's, there's no particular order. Obviously, we're not going to radio with a, with an emphasis track or anything like that. Right. But we're trying to ease the audience into the uh, next EP, and and it's fun to do that with everything from interview segments like this to you know putting together some DIY video. Um, sure. And uh, yeah, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised uh, by what. How much, how much we were able to create with so little time and money. <laughs> and separately, I would imagine, right? Uh, that, that's correct. Yeah. And um, we have a, a gentleman uh, who's a fan and has just been bending over backwards to help us out. His name is uh, Todd Stanton, and he's a videographer and does many things with digital video. And he's been offering to help us uh, you know, take, a, take our pool of footage and our our concept and really help us solidify it into a final product did he help you with some of the vids from the last uh ep that's correct okay yeah i remember the one with the three windows for um tim's song uh, um last time around Uh uh-huh magic how 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 it you know it seemed so unified almost like you could have done it in the same room so that's good yeah, so you know that's that's cool. I imagine this will be kind of more of the same in a way, right? Where it almost seems like it's happening in one spot, but it's it's separate. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's more it's more of a traditional video in that way, like you might would have seen in, on MTV in the early days, even. Okay, uh, I'm curious to see what kind of backdrop they uh, transpose you against. <laughs> you could be on. I don't top. even. I, th- I don't think there was actually any uh, green screen used in when we filmed this footage. So 
uh, again, he, he, he works wonders and uh, even uh, uh, Frankie Siragusa, who was involved in some of the uh, quite a bit of the tracking of the album. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he's, he's participated in helping put it all together. So we're just very lucky. We have these, uh, you know, behind the scene, uh, other band members um, that just really have gone the distance for us. Oh, absolutely. Well, kudos to all of you um, because the videos have been awesome. And it really uh, ties things together nicely, you know, like that Thanks. rug, like that rug Lebowski had, you know, really ties the room together. <laughs> um, yeah. So tell me about the cover art. So it's, uh, I think I remember you had fans submit stuff and you picked one. Is that how it turned out or? Uh, yes and no. So we had uh, a lot more people participated than we could have even imagined. It was very cool. Um. And uh, what ended up happening was while we got, we narrowed it down to a few that we felt were potential and excited about. At the end of the day, we came back to a photo that I believe Tim Smith's wife had taken years ago. Okay. Um, And we just loved the kind of stoic, simple, um, I don't know. What, I don't know what other adjectives to use. Uh, well, it's, <laughs> it's kind of artsy, but yet, is that just a regular photograph? There's no yes, no post production making it look like it's on that rock or anything. It's, no. it's really there, which, which is what intrigued us about it. Yeah, it, it, it almost looked computerized in some way, and it was it was not. Uh, yeah. So we we found ourselves coming back to that photo, but then we all said yes, but it's so. It's so serious. And while that represents a side of us, we felt, we felt that something was missing. And so what ended up happening was we chose what, what is essentially the back cover. Mm-hmm. Um, that was submitted by a fan, which with his permission, we adjusted ever so slightly, but 95% of it comes from him. And we thought that would be great to juxtapose against the front cover. And so, you know, we're also using all of it, the front and back cover and various pieces of promo art. Okay. Uh, uh, There's also a poster of actually the back cover. Uh, And then the inside art is a completely other thing that came from some photo experiments that Eric Dover was doing. Is that the shot of your three heads? Is that the... Uh, No, it has more to do with the backdrop, uh, the very kind of like uh, colorful... It looks like um, rock glass. Uh, it, it's actually from these these gemstones and things that he had been photographing. Oh, okay. So we, you know, we just we had fun with it. We wanted to continue, just like the music of the EP, wanted to continue to go into some uncharted territory, and um, because we we like so many different things, and we're not just about one thing. I mean, a, a lot of our fans, you know, would 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 be just happy and quite uh content to expect us you know here's the three of us portrayed like the archie's comics from the 1960s in in animated form it's like yeah we love that stuff too that's kind of it's kind of like we've been there done that there's like we're just we're just always kind of looking under different rocks for different things something fresh yeah yeah definitely and who wants to be jughead anyway you know (laughs) Come on. Um, did uh, I posted a picture of the, uh, the new album along with your faces and my, you know, for my show promo. And immediately somebody's like that bird, that's an Anhinga. Did you know that's an Anhinga? I have no idea. What, I thought it was some kind of albatross family. And maybe well, I'll tell you a Anhinga little bit is. about it. I looked it up because I hadn't right. heard of it either. Uh, it says the Anhinga, yeah. sometimes called the snake bird, Darter or American darter or water turkey is a water bird from the warmer parts of America. The word Anhinga comes from a Brazilian Tupi language and means devil bird or snake bird. Oh, so now snake you know. bird. yeah, that's I will pass that on. <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe kind of wonder too. It's like, well, at first I just thought, oh, is this guy right? And then I looked up a picture and it looked just like it. And it was like, okay, yeah, he's a bird or he knows. So um, yeah, cool. So I thought we'd talk about each one of the tracks a little bit. Um, sure. First, I wanted to ask a bit about how you go about 
parsing out the harmonies uh, and if it differs, I'm sure each song dictates something different. Um, but I'm but kind of wondered how you guys put all those together and and why you choose the harmonies you choose. Uh, it's like some. It seems like you're not always going for the traditional choices. You're kind of, you know, mixing it up. Well, you, you, again, yeah, mi mixing it up is right in there. It's part of the methodology. Um, there is no strategy per se. Um, the ba first of all, we all enjoy. Um, Again, not always, but often, uh, harmony-rich songs. We, we enjoy the human voice and, and the acrobatics of the human voice um, within a lot of our arrangements. So Eric might have an idea for a background part. Any of us might have an idea for a background part. And it just may be a concept, or somebody may actually have put down a scratch part. Like, I was hearing this counter harmony in the bridge. You know, check it out. And... Again, if we are all like, wow, that's moving us in a cool way, let's, let's get in there and figure out what it's going to be. Is it going to be just one person singing it? Is it going to be multi-tracked a thousand times so it's really juicy and surreal and otherworldly? Or is it just going to be naked and raw and a little whisper over in the right-hand side of the stereo spectrum? Or is that melody that you just suggested going to be harmonized? Are three people going to sing it? So it's going to sound like Roger McGuinn and the birds kind of come in for a second and then disappear Wh whatever it is and that's really fun for all of us so as as challenging as that can be uh and as heady and mathematical and uh, a lot of music theory and stuff that can be involved to create that uh, and then of course very time consuming to execute it because just just because we're fantasizing about this part doesn't mean we just walk up to the mic and do it some of our voices our, our voices all have different ranges some of us can really hit notes hard in certain ranges and sink into a character. Other people can't. And so the other guy has to come in and here you take over here. I mean, uh, are there times when you try it stacked a certain way and you're like, Ooh, that doesn't sound so hot. Let's try absolutely. it instead. And you just keep trying the combination. Absolutely. That, that happens all the time. Exactly. Because as much as we believe in an idea in a part, you don't know if it's working until you try it. Sure. Well, just trying it is going to be hours of vocal stacking and vocal arranging and recording and getting it in tune and getting it in time and all. And then you kick back and go, okay, we did all our parts. What do we think? Yeah. Right. That kind of sounds like Frankie Valley in the four seasons. And that's not what we were going for. Right. Yeah. So do we still believe in the part? If so, let's get rid of version a and let's strategize about how we might do it differently. Do you um, use it's just other... super time consuming? Oh, I can I can imagine. And is that something that you have to do all together in one room, or is there a way to kind of do it from a distance and kind of get a handle on it? So by the time you get to the studio to record it, you already know. Uh, well, we had the luxury of doing most of it in person uh, prior to COVID. Yeah, uh, because so Tim awesome. Tim flew out from Georgia on you know on the band fun. <laughs> um, to work in person for a few weeks at a time. So we tried to knock out a lot of the vocals in person, uh, but then it, but for EP number one, but for EP number two, didn't have that luxury. So we did uh, like all the vocals on Snolly Goss Dragoon, except the lead vocal, that was all done long distance. And it was <laughs> a huge undertaking. Again, it was fun because we were excited about the parts. Uh, Tim came up. Tim came up with a lot of uh, counter melody parts that he was hearing in his head. Uh, that frankly, I don't know that he would have heard early on when we were working on the song. It wasn't. It wasn't until the song kind of locked into place, and we're like, "Wow, re I really like what the band and the music are doing." Eric's lead vocals on top it makes a lot of sense, and I had the idea for the that Snolly Goster Goon, that big operatic vocal stack. Yeah, how big is that? Was that? The only, that was the only idea I had for a background vocal. Yeah. And then Tim, Tim had all these, all those little doodad parts, that some of the, the talking ones and the, the speech ones. Sorry, my phone's exploding. Um, uh, all of the, these little momentary harmonies that come in once and you never hear them again. So many of those came from Tim almost like a week before we were ready to mix because he finally he'd really digested the song and he's like, Oh, I see what it could be. Well, I'm going to ask Eric and Roger what they think of these ideas. And there were a lot of them that we agreed 
would be beneficial, but we still had to <laughs> farm them out and execute them separately with this, this loose game plan in mind. So, and we pulled it off. I'm very happy. You know, that's probably my favorite thing about this second EP is that it was such a crazy experiment uh, that very often I was like, you know, I don't know if this is going to work. Like, you know, these two songs were sounding great, but these two here, or these three here, they weren't getting the finish line yet. And, and I didn't necessarily know how I could help us get it there, what was missing and what experiments we still needed to try. So um, I was kind of nervous early on, but we all kind of, you know, held hands long distance and made it to the finish line together because I'm very happy with the results. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it sounds awesome. Um, now is all the vocal stuff done old school or do you ever put a dash of auto tune in there later to sweeten the mix or give it a modern. Shape? Oh we're, yeah. We're not, we're not precious about uh, using the computer to help us get what we need. I mean, I, I use the computer for keyboards, guitars, drums uh, you know, and as you know, many of, many of those plugins and effects and things, they're all recreations of the original stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's still essentially a studio piece, even though it's uh, been, um, uh, what's the word, um, modeled. Yeah, okay. Uh, and the thing is, singing in tune is singing in tune. There's, especially with a lot of dense chords and stuff that we do, you, you have to sing it in tune. Um, there's not, a, it's not very forgiving. Yeah. Uh, if if like one person's out, the whole thing sounds out. It's not like the plugin's going to fix that, you know? No, exactly. It, it also, exactly. There's so many things that you have to know as a singer that you have to get right uh, from the get-go. If you need to bring in the computer to nudge it this way, nudge it this way, bump it here, that's all that happens, right? It's, it's right, right? You say, if you're a, 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 a pretty face uh, is going to be naturally, is going to have natural beauty. All the makeup's going to do is, is enhance this or that or magnify what's already there. Sure. Um, you, can't, you, can't, you can't prop up with, with makeup and, and plastic reconstruction and all these kinds of things. You can't be something that's it's not, you know, you, get, you get the analogy. Thing, you know, like putting lipstick on a pig. You know? Ex exactly. <laughs> You know, it's not going to change. The top layer isn't going to make it. Um, okay, well, that's cool. Yeah, and, you know, no shame in doing that. I mean, everybody uses it nowadays. And it isn't obvious on y'all stuff. It doesn't sound like you're just dripping in it, you know, so. Well, and the thing is, yeah, thing, things like <clears throat> tuning plugins and uh, effects and, and, and so forth, if those didn't exist or you didn't have the ability to say, wow, I love... I love the entrance of that phrase, but I was too anxious. I was too antsy. I, I, I jumped the gun. I came in too early, but the magic's there. Well, the computer, I can just bump it. I can delay it in time and all my magic is still there. And now my timing is, is spot right. on. Yeah, sure. If that didn't exist, I already know what it should be. It's gotta be magical. It's gotta be in time. It's gotta be in tune. It has to have, right? It has to have those three things. Sure. I'm just going to sit in front of the mic for days and hours until it's right. So, if, I mean, if the computer can actually speed up the process a little bit, then, then the public, <laughs> the public gets the EP quicker. <laughs> sure. So, so in some ways it's a little easier with modern technology compared to how you did it back in the jellyfish days or. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. A a absolutely. But see, again, whether you're talking about jellyfish yes any any of these people that we admire who've done great things with their musical art you know the bowies of the world it's like that stuff you have you have to have it down before you you have to understand it and have your skill set together before you attempt to record i don't care if you're in a major studio for thousands of dollars a day or your home studio you've you've got to have your craft honed being honed the vision, right? I mean, the world is full of talentless people that have careers because they're good on social media and the computers basically made their record. Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> it's, there's not much soul, there's not much magic, there's not much uniqueness, there's not that specialness. You can't, you can't 
recreate a Marvin Gaye out of the computer. It's just not going to happen. Uh, you, can get a bu- you can get a bunch of things that infer that brilliance, that suggest that brilliance, that come close, uh, technically speaking, but you can't, you can't, there's no plug in for soul and there never will be. <laughs> boy. Right? So that's why te- technology, ever since I was a little boy, I was like, oh, synthesizers are going to replace the orchestra and drum machines are going to replace drummers. <clears throat> well, all that's happened is drum machines and synthesizers have actually created new genres of music that benefit from and are really cool because they use drum machines and synthesizers and electronics sure. and, and plug in the computer. But what most producers and recording people have discovered is that I can't, I can't ever replace the humanness that, and the subtleties that happen with a real drummer. Sure. Why would I want to replace all the subtleties of a real orchestra with a synthesizer simulation or a sample? So, of, co- of course, there are exceptions to all, you know, there's, there's people whose budgets are limited and they, ha- they, they bring in this and they know it doesn't sound as good as the real thing, but the, the public won't care. They just want to hear, you know, but at the end of the day, you talk to anybody making records now, and unless they're doing, unless they're very young and they haven't had the experience working with a lot of humans and people who are masters of their instrument and can be great interpreters of their songs, the way a film score would sit in front of a symphony and have that symphony uh, interpret and recreate what he heard in his head. Um, if, if all you're doing is making music that is um, beat generated, computer generated, it is a, a huge uh, prefab element to it which is fine, not diminishing that, but it's, it's one box, it's one room. And the world of music making, pop, rock, and otherwise and beyond is so vast and so varied and you can do so many things with it. That's what continues to keep me interested. Um, if I was only operating in this small realm of, of TikTok top 40 uh, this week's, you know, Frankie uh, Avalon and Annette Funicello prefab pop creation. Uh, it would get so boring so fast. Hey, everybody likes a beach party. Just not every day. <laughs> I, exactly. Yeah. I, I love those movies. <laughs> yeah, they are, they're awesome. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about each track and kind of what went into it and who's featured on it. Um, why don't we start with the single, The Dream That Took Me Over. Um I, there's a couple of bands that came to mind and I'm sure you've already probably heard this. Um, Roxy music is the first thing that popped into my head when I heard that tune and that, that kind of vibe, I suppose. And I suppose maybe a Duran Duran thing, but then you realize that Duran Duran was totally into Roxy music and chic. So kind of a blend of all those things. Yeah. I, I mean, all of the above and none and, of it, <laughs> overtly intentionally but of, right. of course it's like it's like we're listening to those records and are inspired by those records and productions and those song stylings and those genres as much as anything um and yeah er, the, that song uh, the core of it came from an idea of eric's and it always it always had this kind of heavy tough uh groove thing to it so we were just looking for ways to have the licorice quartet kind of put our stamp and have fun playing. See, that, that's, what, that's, that's what can be fun about songwriting and arranging in particular is you've got this song idea and everybody believes in it, but you're, you can't make it and force it be anything in the whole world. It kind, of, it kind of comes out almost prefab and you get to choose whether you're gonna honor that vibe and attitude and sentiment that that the initial idea is in this case uh eric so the minute the minute eric was playing it on guitar for me and tim we'd never heard it before you could hear there's this there's this pulse to it and it has this mood and the chorus has this very elongated melody and eric had i believe most of the words finished at the time so we're already getting this kind of atmosphere to the song me and Tim had a positive reaction. It was like, hey, this, let's, let's look at developing this further. Well, the last thing you want to, you're, you're not going to, I mean, 
you can do whatever you want, but you, what you're not going to do is say, wow, that's, that's really fantastic. What if it was a reggae thing? Right. Yeah. It's like, it's, well, you could do that. And we're, yeah. we're skilled enough musicians that we could experiment with that song as a reggae version or re- arrangement. But if, if we're trying, if we're trying to pay attention and honor to this spiritual energy, that's kind of coming out of Eric as he's presenting this idea and what it just sounds like harmonically and stuff. It's like, why would you do that? <laughs> it's like, let, let's, let's see. It, cl- it clearly is leaning in this direction. Let's play with that some more first. We can always veto it. Sure. But, but you know, you, it's, it's about trying to allow the song to almost uh, birth itself. And, and you're facilitating that through the recording process. But what you don't want to do is get in the way of it. You don't, you don't want your ego or, you know, you're really into this artist or this sound this week. So this song, you want to, I want this song to be the vehicle for that. It's like, no, 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 no. The song has to be what it needs to be. Sure. And that's, that's a practice that I really uh, try to adhere to. And the more I kind of allow, it's, it's very kind of Zen that way. And, uh, you know, we all have a lot of musical skill and, the temptation is to overproduce something, overthink something, overarrange something. Um, and part of that art, of course, is to just know when less is more, uh, when, 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 when simplicity is going to be more effective than complex overproduction and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, so is that mostly Eric singing the lead on The Dream That Took Me Over? Yes. Is that it almost sounds like you at the very beginning? No, that, that's Eric. That's Eric. Uh, Tim, Tim sings a bunch of harmony. I actually do a lot of the vocoder harmony that you hear later in the song. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's le- that song is less um, interweaved with different lead singers and things than some other. of the other ones. Okay, well, that yeah, super catchy. Um, what are some of the boards you used on that one? Wow. I used a really heavily processed piano. It has a lot of uh, fast phase shifter and chorusing on it, those little sparkles that come in. Um, wow, well, I used this uh, Technique synthesizer. It's Technique? almost like a home keyboard. Yeah, it's like a home keyboard. Oh, um, yeah, they made like stereos and stuff in the 70s. Yeah, they? They, have a, they had a huge line of keyboards that I believe were mostly popular um, in Asia, but they are, they're, they're like one man band type keyboards, you know, for the home organist kind of thing. Oh yeah. They have a huge, a huge product line of, of stuff. And I found one that uh, was surprisingly flexible with very interesting. They're synthesized sounds, but it's, it's their version of them. They don't sound like Moogs. They don't sound like Rollins. They don't sound like Korgs and all that traditional synths. Cool. Uh, so a lot of those sounds that are the waterfalls, those sparkly waterfalls, that, that's coming yeah. from the Techniques keyboard. Um, just some poly synths for the, the, the pads. And uh, I think I even use a, a soft synth um, for the, uh, yeah, that real Durrani kind of sequence, sequency arpeggiation thing. Mm-hmm. So it's a, a, you know, arp string ensemble doing a lot of the violin type sounds. Uh, those kind of disco Euro Euro disco violins. So it's all, it's all over the map. Yeah. Well, it's a delicious blend and that's just a a good kind of top down summer kind of tune, I think. So when it gets here, yeah. Crank it up and go to the beach. (laughs) Um, How about, do you feel better? What can you tell us about that one? Yeah, let's see. Um, Wow. (laughs) That's, Well, so that's a song. So I'm really happy with how that song came up because it was, again, the core of the idea was a very kind of acoustic, kind of Brit British pop folk idea of Tim Smith's. Yeah, I thought it sounded like a Tim song. Yeah, and he's singing. He's singing the verses, most of the lead there in the verses and chorus, uh, etc. Um, but the kind of the joy of that song was we all really believed in it just when he played it on guitar. I was like, that's a solid tune. Sure. So flushing it out with a band and overdubs and things, 
sky was the limit. Again, it was like, let's, let's do whatever we want as long as we don't take it away from that kind of core and that vibe that, that seems to be created when Tim's playing it. <clears throat> um, so there's all kinds of elements. In fact, the third verse, that kind of breakdown verse after the guitar solo, up until like a week before we mixed it, that was still the guitar and the band just powering through. And we said, yeah, but we've done that already. And it just kind of feels flat when we arrive here on this third verse again, because it's just more of the same. And we always like to have the songs evolve and grow over time, especially if there's repetitive parts. Sure. So we experimented with muting all the guitars and basically the band. And then we brought the drums, they, the drums kind of sneak in slowly. And the whole thing goes into this real keyboard heavy, dr like dream sequence with, with uh, slightly different harmony and, and chordal accompaniment. This is something, you know, Yes did all the time. Sure. It's like we, we, we learn these things from these people. And, and uh, yet, you know, do you feel better? <laughs> yes would never do a song like that in a million years, but you can still em employ their influence and the, the way they at, the, arranged as a four, a four piece band. Sure. Um, and it's really fun to do that. And then the whole, the whole outro of that song turns into this kind of almost very kind of British uh, pub rock thing. The, the, the honky tonk piano takes over. And uh, yet we don't, we, we always, we're, we're always very careful. I, well, I, I should say I am. Cause I, I like, I like when stuff gets fun and silly uh, and playful, not silly, playful is the word, childlike, but I always like to have the rock in there. I still like that it's, that it's tough and it's like, it's got attitude. And, and so many of my glitter heroes from the early 70s in, in Britain did that. They did very uplifting, cheerful, playful music, but it was, it was always tough. It always still had yeah. that, that, that teenage street gang thing to it. Yeah, kind of like T-Rex is a good example. Exactly. He, he's, he's like the epitome of that. And so Eric's guitar, uh, you know, dun, 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 it's really loud. It's really stereo. It's really big, heavy Les Pauls. It's Eric Dover rock attitude. You know, it's like that kind of imperial drag thing in there. So you get this really great blend. Um, and I just couldn't be happier with what that song, what, you know, hopefully uh, we might even release a song like that in, we'll show the public what the stages, the evolution of the song were. We did that with Lighthouse Spaceship. Uh, yeah, yeah. That if was you really noticed uh, at, uh, at uh, our Facebook site and so forth. And that was really fun because there were like six segments of the evolution of Lighthouse Spaceship. Oh, yeah. I'd love to do that with uh, Do You Feel Better? Yeah, do that. Yeah, that was very enlightening and, and a lot of fun to tune in and check out. So, yeah. yeah. And um, what boards did you use on that one? Do you feel better? Uh, so again, some heavily processed piano. Um, I use some wavetable synthesis stuff, uh, Waldorf's and things, which are, you know, the ev the later evolutions of the PPG synthesizer, that oh, yeah. wavetable yeah. synth, if, which has a very unique sound. Uh, I had my versions of that. Um, what else? Uh, oh, some some crazy random samples that are playing some weird processed uh, orchestral string stuff off of uh, my Mirage sampler, the old 8-bit sampler. Uh, we use some of that to create some of these just random, like, what the heck, what's that that's going on there, you know, as opposed to just having real strings or uh, something like that. Um, I'm trying to think what else, uh, because there's just so many. Um, well, there's like a marimba marimba comes in on a, a oh, yeah. couple moments yeah um there's lots of drum machine actually playing little fills uh, a drum machine comes in the bridge with these kind of mechanical claps and things mm -hmm. make certain parts see the song is very campfire um and i like the fact that there's these little moments that become very inorganic and yeah. and stiff and computerized uh in an otherwise very raw organic folky acoustic song very cool um what do you what kind of influence has have eric and and tim had on you vocally well that's a really cool question because uh 
as a singer, you try to, I mean, see, I'm, I'm still learning what my voice can and can't do, what, what my strengths and weaknesses are, which, what territory I should practice and develop further, and what other territory I think I've, I've really got nailed. Um, and when you watch closely, someone like Eric, someone like Tim sing, and you work with them closely, you see that everybody gets there differently. Uh, some people are more trained and schooled and have a lot of traditional command of their vocal muscles and their abdomen and breathing and all that. And other people are completely self-taught and everything in between. And um, obviously people's vocal ranges are different too. Sure. People's sense of pitch is different. Uh, where they hear their voice sitting against the chords. For example, Eric and I working in Imperial Drag together, we learned very early on singing together so often that he, and he, he was the one that discovered this, uh, he leans a bit sharp when he sings. I lean a bit flat when I sing. Mm. Now, these are only problems if when you're singing together, it sounds terrible, right? Because then you got to figure out why. <clears throat> but it really helps to start learning things like that because then you can overcompensate. Um, you can be aware of these things and try to correct them um, so that you don't have to sing it 20 times. You know, you, you're, just, you're just paying more attention. But it also, it also affects how you create harmonies uh, and chords and things, background vocals. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's – uh, I don't know that we've influenced each other. I think we – Watching other singers and experiencing other singers just helps you be more aware of your approach. Sure. Um, uh, and, and, and phrasing. Um, uh, plus, plus, one of the coolest things about singing, once you have a melody that you like and you think is strong, execution is everything, right? So sure. we often say we think of Paul McCartney. Well, we love his very lyrical, melodic voice. I guarantee you, you could put 10 other very talented singers singing that exact melody, and it wouldn't necessarily be as effective. You still might go, oh, what a, that's a gorgeous melody, and that would be cool and great, but it's the, de it's the delivery. I, I know it, um, it's almost like I'm stating the obvious here, but it's the way, it's the way, there's so many ways to interpret melody. I mean. Right. That's why there's standards. There's classic standards in, in rock and in, uh, musicals, that, songs that we've known that our grandparents have known for the last sure. 50, 60 years. That whether it was Frank Sinatra or whomever, Barbara Streisand or whoever, you know, Diana Ross, they would keep coming back to these songs. Well, every one of those people, the whole thing was, how did they interpret it? Do we like Streisand's version better than we do? old blue eyes's version better than we do louis armstrong's version whatever it is that's because there's so much personality and inflection and um interpretation that you can do with a classic melody and so that's why often you'll have people who are like oh let's sing this beatles song yeah they're singing it but they're saying, they're, they're missing 90 percent of the 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 vibe and sentiment that's conveyed through if it's a McCartney song, his melody. Sure. Um, and uh, so that's part of like, if, if Licorice Cortez is a song that we're working out, uh, this, this happened on Lighthouse Spaceship. There were uh, melodies that I wrote that I said, I could sing this, but it's going to sound better if Eric Dover sings it. Eric's going to really be, be able to lay into it in a different way with his phrasing and approach. And having worked with him before, I was just more familiar with what that would be. Sure. So I was very happy to let him take over and see what would happen if he did. You know, Hall & Oates wrote all their songs together, but Daryl Hall sings 90% of it. True. I, I, I guarantee you half the melodies he's singing, John uh, Oates wrote. Um, they were uh, a great team that way. And, um, uh, you know, there have been many instances of this. Um, uh, I'm sure John Anderson sings many melodies that Steve Howe wrote. Yeah. Or, uh, or that Chris, Chris Squire, Squire wrote. Sure. Um, uh, because 
as talented a singer as all of them are, John just has this undeniable tone. He's got this crazy range. Sure. Um, and, uh, but that's why we also enjoy the Fish Out of Water solo album. That's like, oh, yeah. It, then it's like, wow, Chris, you've got a heck of a range yourself. <laughs> his, vo- his voice is crazy. Yeah. Oh, it really is. And some of those harmonies he did with John were just really unconventional, and that made them all the cooler. The whole, the whole, the whole thing. I mean, you could actually, for the Yes fan, you could have an entire documentary on just Chris Squire's persona okay. in that group. Oh, you can go deep with them. You know, I've done two episodes about the history of Yes. Oh. The first, the first one, I thought I was going to talk about their entire fifty-year career. We made it up to drama, and it took us three hours. <laughs> That's I'm surprised you got it done that quickly. Yeah. yeah, well, I got two Yes historians that are kind of friends of mine online. That guy, One guy wrote a book, and the other guy put together the most extensive Yes information site on the internet, basically. And, um, and it was great. It was just a deep dive, talking about every album, album by album, every lineup change. So, uh, yeah, we reconvened to do vo- uh, part two. And it was like, you think we could make it to the end today in three hours? It's like, damn it, we're going to one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're actually, those turned out to be two of my most popular episodes. So I've been oh, inspired amazing. to do part three, where we're going to look at solo albums and offshoots, you know, like UK and Bruford and all that cool stuff. Right. Yeah. So I digress, though. Um, okay, let's see what else we got here. Um Snally Goster Goon. Uh, am I right that that's been around since the Imperial Drag Days? Uh, well, the core of that idea was, yes, the core of that idea was written around that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and like a lot of these, you know, uh, they've remained unfinished for years, not fleshed out. Uh, but there's something about it that, you know, we believed in. Um, and it was worth exploring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, what else to talk about on that song? Uh, again, we were excited to explore a very fast, high energy, almost uh, punk. It's very, very kind of punk, uh, but with a lot, lots of melody in it. Is this the song where you played the guitar and you had to, you didn't use your Firebird because that would have sounded too nice and you used some <laughs> kind of cheap guitar that you had to tune every time you changed the chord? So yeah, there's, a, there's a little bit of, yeah, there's a little bit of footage of that. So I play, basically, if you listen to the mix, I'm the guitar on the left. Uh, Tim's playing most of the guitar on the right. Uh, Eric's doing all kinds of overdubs and that huge guitar stack in the instrumental section of the song that's this almost this noise ambient yeah, really solo. Kind of dissonant kind of bit. Yeah, that's all, that's from, that's all from the mind of Eric Dover. We, we, did, we did not know. We knew that would be an instrumental section. That we knew there would not be any singing. But we didn't know what it should be. Yeah, well, it's um, interesting. It isn't your typical guitar solo section, you know. No, and it kind of clouds the waters in a way harmonically, where you're kind of thinking, "Am I losing my marbles?" You know, it's and that that's good though. Well, that that's that's exactly right. That was intentional. We were so not interested in. I mean, the most boring thing in the world to us would be to try to play some generic guitar solo there, no matter how innovative it was. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was really the three, the three, I saw all three of us play guitar on that song in some capacity. Uh, and again, I think that's what keeps it just a little more, you know, just that extra uniqueness and specialness that the three of us bring yeah. uh, to well, that. Well, and, just the fact know. that nobody's precious about it, that you're all playing guitar and mixing it up, you know, it's like whoever's the best man for the job does the job, you know. Right, exactly. And, and, and it's almost like that's an instance where my lack of traditional guitar chops actually became an asset because I do have this really emotionally driven angst to my guitar performance that, uh, you know, I guess, again, my handicap kind of works for me in that instance, but the guitar was, uh, so poorly made and so uh, old uh, that it could, it just didn't stay in tune. But you remember we, what brand it was? I think it was a crown. They're all, they're all like 60s, 70s Japanese okay. um, uh, guitars. It was a hollow body. Uh, and I think Frankie had one too. Uh, it was similar. 
we might have used that on a portion of it. But uh, Frankie was, <laughs> it was literally, he said, well, put your hand on the position and start strumming it. And you could tell two of the strings would be out, even though my, my technique wasn't that off. Right. He, and he would just, he said, okay, hold that chord. And he'd go over and he'd bring it into tune. And then we would literally record just that bar and a half, two bars of the song that had that chord in it. Wow. That's a lot. Very frustrating. But we could see, we could see after about one verse that this was going to work. So we had to go, to, we had to go to the finish line. Yeah. Well, that song's quite a, quite a ride. You know, there's a lot, a lot of information packed into that three and a half minutes there. Um, yes. Um, Again, we wanted to see where we could take it. Uh, and, um, you know, Tim, Tim's background vocal ideas really help. Uh, we had a lot of fun divvying up the lead vocal. We knew that Eric was going to sing the chorus. His voice uh, has so much power higher, in a higher range. And you do that other part, that da, 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 yeah. da, 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 da. So I go into a different character there, falsetto. Yeah, very kind of. Well, it's, it's almost like a whimsical it's it's haunting dreamy childlike and so i do kind of do my my falsetto voice up there and then it goes slamming back into the the tough guy voice and then tim and i trade off singing the verse so you're getting this whole i mean this is how this is how they do musicals yeah uh, a musical piece um and we enjoy playing with that even though this song is not you know <laughs> it's not intended for any kind of play or uh, opera or anything like that, but it has those elements. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. It makes me think of Todd and some of his uh, uh, Broadway-esque excursions in a way, you know? Yep. Can't remember that tune that's on the Todd album that's like... From yeah, H I know which one you're thinking or whatever it was. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, what guitars I, I'm seeing Eric mostly playing a Les Paul on the different clips I've seen is, is that the bulk of what he used? Uh, maybe a little uh, Kelly in there for some clean stuff. It's uh, again, there's no, there's no right way. He has a variety of sounds at his disposal. I think he, uh, he does enjoy seeing how many different places he can take the Les Paul other than the obvious, um, you know, thick and meaty yeah yeah um he gets uh one of the fun things to do in this trio um with respect to the guitar is to lay down a a rhythm bed of drums and bass maybe an acoustic guitar maybe a basic keyboard piano part or something and um eric will often just take that home and he'll just start doing layers and layers of experiments uh, it's particularly interesting if he's not the one that's necessarily, if the core of the song idea didn't come from him. So he's, he's literally walking into somebody else's head, somebody else's world and, and just seeing what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> not everybody can do this. Not every band can do this because Eric would often come in Light, lighthouse spaceship is a good example. He spent weeks throwing all kinds of ideas at lighthouse spaceship. Well, we didn't use all of them. You know, there were ideas we'd, we'd bring up and we'd have to look at them and go, man, you went to the edge of the earth here, but we really feel it's, it's taking it over here. And, you know, it's, it's um, flying in the face of the original emphasis and attitude of the song. But these two ideas over here, now that's something we weren't even thinking about. Like the, the whole, um, there's a whole section he does he, he threw some harmonies on the end of that song, but there's, oh, there's those, there's those little um, leads that pop up, those big stereo leads that pop up in Lighthouse that are all him. They're very, uh, they're very fanciful, but they sound, um, I don't even know how to describe them. I mean, they're kind of, they're kind of glittery. They're almost like something Phil Manzanera would do or even Fripp or something. Sure. But they're momentary. They're not, the song doesn't become that. They're just these, these flares that kind of shoot off. I wasn't hearing something like that in a million years. And then when I heard his part do that, I was like, Oh my God, that that's exactly what needs to be here. Yeah. We're right. keeping that. And it's going to, so it would influence what the, then the other instruments might do in that section. It's really nice so, when it happens. <laughs> yeah. All that stuff just feeds 
off of each other, but you have to have the trust in your partners, the faith in yourself, that everybody's not always going to like everything all the time, that all the experiments aren't always going to work. Um, and, um, well, you know, another one, uh, if you can hear it on the um, chorus of Do You Feel Better? There are these little stabs that are drowning in reverb, and they're going, so the chorus is... Um, Dun, bum, 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 bum. Right, it's trucking along like that. Bum, bum, bum. And Eric has this guitar part. If you listen, it goes, bing, 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 bing. They're like these chimes, and they're they're drowning in uh, spring reverb, and they're going like. Oh, nice! It's a very, very uh, sci-fi, very outer limits, um, very almost like a '60s surf guitar. Sure. Yeah. I love that. Just whacked out super fast vibrato. Kinda. Yeah. Well, neither Tim and I were thinking of anything remotely like that. Like that would have been the last thing to pop into my head, but it came from his mind and him getting lost in his world of experimenting and just pushing the boundaries. Um, <laughs> we just like, it was only, I remember us hearing it and going, I don't know what we're going to do with that, but it's brilliant. We're, we, we're, we have to find a way to have it massage into the big picture. And it does. And it, it, it influences the, the whole attitude of that. Sure. Um, any board in particular featured on Snolly Goster? No. Well, let's see. Uh, there's one that sound I really like, which is like a, it's like an RMI electric piano, which sure. was used quite a bit in the seventies. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, Rick, Rick, yeah, yeah. All over the early Before yesterday. the Yamaha came out, that was the best, as close as you could get to a piano on stage, wasn't it? Uh, well, that and the Rhodes, of course. Right, yeah. But the, Ro the Rhodes was so round and warm that uh, right. this one was much more spiky and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, almost like electric harpsichord. Sure, yeah. I want to say, I'm thinking like Tony <laughs> Banks used that too, like Carpet Crawl yes. or some of those kind of tunes. That's RMI Electric Piano. So I use that on... Um, there's the breakdown of the second verse where we mute the guitars for a second. And it just kind of goes to the keyboards playing, maybe it's the third verse, the keyboards playing almost like this switched on Bach kind of Neo Baroque moment. Sure. It's, it's fancy. It's light. It's, it's just square peg and a round hole before you slam back into the punk rock guitar world. Right. And then I do like this very fast Jerry Lee Lewis thing as we exit that. So it's just experiments like that, that uh, you just have to try them and then they add this momentary flavor and then they're gone. I, I really like how that came out. It sounds very kind of British pub to me, uh, which I, there's so many bands of that era that I really like late seventies. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, melody punk. <laughs> I've been on a squeeze kick lately. You listen to them much? Uh, they are, um, obviously certain periods more than others, but they are, they're, uh, yeah, they're rarely brought up in interviews. They're, they are as big an influence on me as any, anything. Oh man. I would love to talk about them for just a minute if we could, because this year, yeah, I picked up about five of their albums and I got to say, Glenn Tilbrook is a brilliant lead guitarist. I mean, I know. I mean and that's not what he's known for. <laughs> heart, I mean, can you think of a better, more perfect guitar solo? I mean, he, and he's such a killer friggin' singer too. He's just the, He's the total package, you know. He's just amazing. well, yeah. Not not obviously him. He's the mouthpiece of the group, but you know him teaming up with Chris and the incredible lyrics that happen there, and then what they do with their voices and the octaves. Yeah, that's kind of unusual. Uh, I mean, most people wouldn't go for octaves. Oh man, no, it's completely yeah. In a very easy way, they created the sound of squeeze. Yeah, it's like, well, let's just let Chris do it. He he's has the higher, you know, more traditional blue eyed soul vocal sound. <clears throat> but there's a whole period where that that the, the octaves is the vocal sound. And um, and then they always surrounded themselves with such a great uh, band, too. Yeah, and there's that there's that period. They have so many great periods. But I was so pleasantly surprised by the period. Well, Paul Carrick's in the band briefly. Yeah, that's a East Side attempted. story. That correct album, one of them and then i think i think the album right after that called uh cosi fan tutti fruity well actually there's one in between it and i have it right here it's called sweets from a stranger which all right 
black yep. well, that, bed. that has many hits on it as well. Yeah, this is a kind of gets falls between the cracks. Um, Cozy Fan Tootie, though, is one of my favorites. There's the, just the way the chord progressions are on. Oh, my God. Just yeah. Gets me, man. That the, the songwriting on that just exactly. Um, for some reason, that re resonates at a deeper. It's no different than Elvis Costello's Imperial Bedroom album. OK, yeah. I, I mean, close. I like Elvis's whole catalog. But for some reason, the Imperial Bedroom album just slam dunks for me the whole time and takes me into this world that I never want to leave. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's the Tractions, the same band that's on most of those great records. And they're sure. one of the greatest bands yeah. ever, ever to exist in rock, in my, in my opinion. Oh, and and it Squeeze is uh, similar that way. <clears throat> and um, one of the fun things for me about Squeeze, or one of the ways they've influenced me so much is they've done that magical thing that so many Brits have done where they're heavily inspired by um, American, American urban soul and gospel and all the, all the Motown and uh, uh, the black American influence on pop and the great things that happened in the States. And then when the Brits get a hold of that, they do their version of it, you know, in a band like squeeze and it comes out totally different but you can still hear the soul, the, the deep uh, emotional content is always present, but they, but they almost have, the, but these melodic shapes are more, well, they're more European. Uh, they're more um, uh, uh, European song hall, uh, lyrical, musical tradition. I, I can totally I, think I love of that one. combination. I can think of one on Cozy that, um, you know, that song, I learned how to pray every yep. night. That's an Aretha Franklin song. Totally. <laughs> for crying out loud. That's yeah, exactly. Wonderful. And, I mean, uh, Roddy Frame, Aztec Camera, another perfect example of someone who clearly was inspired by that sound and ran with it in his, his own way. Scritty Politi. I mean, there's so, there's so many great, uh, yeah, I guess they, uh, people often call it Blue Eyed Soul. <laughs> I just love that British filter. I mean, true, even yeah. like in the late sixties when the Clapton and all those guys got a hold of American blues. I, I, it's almost BGs. like I, for some reason I gravitated more towards that British blues stuff than I did the original stuff. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I love plenty of the original, but I love what happens when these young art school uh, kids from the cities in England got a hold of it with, with the new, you know, amplification <laughs> of, of, the, of the guitar that they had at their disposal. Such, such an exciting time in music. And, and that stuff still influences me, but I'm really glad, glad you brought up a uh, squeeze because uh, that's just what a, what a catalog. I know it. You know, I'm working my way through it now. I haven't really got past um, cozy, but I've listened to some online and it sounds like every album has some gems on it. You know? They just... Yeah. I mean, I, I like uh, the one right after it too. Babylon. Oh Babylon yeah, I, and on quite sorry, a bit. I do have that one. That that is a good one too. <clears throat> and I like yeah, like you said, I'm sure you can find at least two or three songs on every album. They're just like, this is so good. I know. Uh, then you sit down, and you play, you kind of dissect it, and it's like, I never would have thought to put that chord there. I know. You know that's why I, I know. you know, it's kind of like XDC. I, I think they're kind of in a similar ballpark. Very much. I agree. In fact, I could point to some squeeze songs that sound like they could have been XTC tunes. Like maybe they even influenced them a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, that's, and that's um, for those who care <laughs> that uh, I can say the same thing about some Elvis Costello songs where it's like, wow, is this Elvis trying to be Andy Partridge or is this Andy Partridge trying to be Elvis Costello? There's like, uh, or, you know, being inspired by what their, what their contemporaries are doing at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and squeeze falls into there and uh, that is such a powerful uh, time in songwriting that has inspired me because real because really what is it is what it is it's uh, all the kids that grew up uh, at the peak of the Beatles but they were 10 11 12 13 years old you know before they they came into their own power and and so although you had punk and ska and <clears throat> Uh, you're coming out of, of, of glitter uh, and all these things. They were like, well, we're going to do rock on our own terms and whatever that means. Right. But you couldn't beat the melody out of them. Right. It was in their DNA. So, so this is, this is why it's such an incredible time in music, whether we're talking about <clears throat> the Smith, Susie and the Banshee, Echo and the Bunnymen, uh, uh, human league, all these incredible uh, 
synth pop and post punk uh, groups, magazine. Um, there's just there's so many of them uh, <clears throat> that are all there. It's also hook laden because because they understand the art of the, and the craft of songwriting. Why? Well, because it's what they were drowning in when they were when they were kids. Good point. Yeah. So even though they're trying to forge new ground and make their artistic statement, which is thank God they are, and they're trying to like you know we're tearing down this and it's our post classic rock statement and and right I mean punk is born out of the ashes of of the of the pompous progressive and classic rock Robert Plants and and uh, you know Emerson Lake and Palmer's of the world yeah. it's reactionary to it and that's it's a beautiful thing and they never lost writing a catchy melody in a hook. I mean, that's why, that's why The Damned is one of my favorite bands of all time because they are that, that incredible marriage of everything great that came out of psychedelic pop of the 60s and Sid Barrett world and all that stuff. And even, even some proggy things that were happening with, with pretty things and, and uh, as, as all the bands tried to get psychedelic right you've got uh, i love the album uh, rolled gold where the the action is like oh, yeah. they're finally making their psychedelic statement everybody's making their psychedelic statement that's such a rich <clears throat> area to mine for uh, po uh pop to me but all these artists who then went into punk and new wave and synth pop and all that stuff they never lost that that understanding is like we've got to have a melody that people can't get out of their heads and if and we got we got to take them we got to transport them to this other world this other place and so you even have bands like Depeche Mode who are just like we're only going to do it with drum machines and all synthesizers and and it's going to have these uh these grooves and these pulses these these beats so this was almost like a you know their version of like a club rock and stuff but wh why has Depeche Mode lasted this long because from the get-go they understood hooks, 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 melody, melody, melody. Yep. You know, because they, they grew up, it was all around them. You know, it's kind of just seeps into your pores. Even when you want to cut a new direction, it's at yep. the cornerstone of your being in a way. So well, I can't tell you how many bands over the years, both American and British, uh, I've gotten to know, you know, we're roughly in the same age group or they were a little older than me. <clears throat> and, you know, you cross paths and you get to know people. I can't tell you how many of them were in projects that you would think they they hated classic rock they hated progressive rock they were all about trying to tear that stuff down and they and they confess he goes you know i'm a huge genesis fan right it's like well of course you are because that's how your mind works it's just because you decided to express yourself in this genre in this avenue doesn't mean you don't <clears throat> weren't influenced by and don't have respect and honor your heroes even even if you know, that's what every generation does. Every generation comes through and goes, no, this is my music and we're going to say it this way. And this is my right. statement. You know, screw, screw you, old man. Right. You know. But yet you're more like your old man than you want to admit. Exactly. I think as time passes, it becomes much more obvious. And it's not such a bad thing. It's like, I don't, I don't exactly. mind being a reflection of my father. You know, when I was 15, I might have, but now I'm quite proud of it. You know, it's funny how that works out. Um, one other interesting group i want to ask you about uh are you into sparks yeah 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 i wow <laughs> that's a whole other that's a whole yeah other i don't interview. want to I'll go that down that rabbit hole too much but yeah I, I got the the kimono my house and uh what a interesting record you know that's just um just nothing to quite like them no uh the song on there called uh thank god it's not christmas oh yeah it that's one of my that's one of my favorite rock anthem you know uh kind of glitter rock songs of all time i mean i just i marvel at the territory that song takes the listener on in such a heavy attitude grand rock spectacle kind of way and and uh but again completely on their own terms they com completely created this sound that nobody has bothered or dare dare try to replicate and uh Man, I'm just so thankful. I'm so so thankful. You know, every time I might bitch about how old I am, I'm so thankful that I lived. I lived through Sparks. You know that I that I lived through 
some of these bands that were just like this blip on the pop rock radar and yeah. and are basically gonna you know no one will ever know about them when our generation dies off <laughs> but uh yeah sparks is one of those epic phenomenons we'll keep an eye out for that holiday tune then <laughs> yeah the anti-holiday tune um, yeah okay so we got one more tune sovereignty blues yeah and it's not a blues for starters no it's not it's more about the it's that mostly comes from the lament the lament and the sentiment of the lyric you know which is which is basically <clears throat> and, the, and the music did not launch out of this in fact the lyric was written very late in the process um but the whole kind of marching energy of the song yeah and that melody that da 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 look at those cavemen go <laughs> wonderful show yeah and there's 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 elements of all kinds of things i, I didn't even think about yeah, that yeah, song that, that, but, um, just makes me think of life on mars uh you know the, the lyric is basically driven by you know there there be if you if you maintain your sovereignty and your awareness and in any aspect of your life you won't be at the effect of all those people that are trying to make you afraid. You know, any, anybody who wants to control or manipulate you or have your, have their way with you is going to try to induce fear and you have to be vigilant and protect what information and what talking heads you allow into your environment. Well, that's very you know? timely. <laughs> yeah. And again, uh, I think the lyric was finished like three years ago. I mean, it's a theme, it's a theme that I've paid attention to a lot of my life because it, there's so many well-meaning authority figures, whether it's a clergyman or your, your parents or a well-meaning school teacher or a politician who's trying to get your vote, whatever it is. Uh, history has proven time and time again. They, they know the quickest way to get you to align with them is to scare the hell out of you. Sure. Which, which can never happen if you understand that that's what's happening and you stand your ground and you say, I, I let into my mind and my heart, what I choose to let into my mind and my heart, no matter what nuttiness seems to be going on in the world. So that's, that's what sovereignty blues is about. It's like, if you're not careful, you're going to lose your sovereignty. You're going to lose your individualism uh, and your <clears throat> identity, uh, your self-reliance, your independence. You're going to lose all those things. If you give it away, unknowing most, in most cases, unknowingly, yeah, well, give it away to the other think, whatever that the other might be first i think these things are not up for grabs you know exactly it's like, it's like i know the difference between right and wrong and there i haven't seen a damn thing on the internet that's going to make me change my mind about that you know yeah. i knew there, the there you go and, right and and <laughs> so that's what the lyric was launched out of and then the, the music was all about it's still um while it's a fairly somber potentially somber subject matter there's a there's a a, a, cheer, a cheerful a cheerfulness and like this crowd energy like i said like a, like a positive march there's a there's a positivity and uplifting thing yeah, to very it much in this in this uh rock march energy so it, again it was it was different territory that we all uh, were interested in pursuing and, and uh explored that who came up with the kernel of the idea for this one? Was this one of yours? Yeah. That's okay. Cause you're, you're pretty much the lead vocalist on this tune, right? Yeah. Well, well, Eric sings the choruses. Okay. I mean, we sing yeah. them as a group, but it's really Eric's voice that leads it. And yes, I sing the verses. Correct. You ever have times where he, he almost, he sings something you think, gosh, that sounds like me. Like you could almost <laughs> emulate each other occasionally. Oh, sure. I mean, that can happen with any, collaborators that are in each in each other's company yeah, a lot yeah a few times yeah. on the record it's kind of like was oh, that roger or is that is you know is mm. that eric you well know. i couldn't when i was a little kid i couldn't tell the beatles apart at all Me either i don't think i could tell the difference until i was about 20 yeah no i remember that hearing is, those, but, oh that's clearly lennon singing there i see and then he's joined by mccartney in the chorus oh i that took forever i mean it's so damn obvious now i don't know how right. i could have missed it but <laughs> At the time, it was just like, they all sound alike to me. I don't get it. Yeah. And they don't. But, you know, to a 15-year-old, you know. Um, 
Very cool. Um, well, I got a couple other questions, and then we'll wrap it up here. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat today. So, vol um, volume two is now available. You can get that at the licorice quartet dot com. Is that right? Correct. Uh -huh. Okay, that's good. And you have it in a lot of different ways. You can get the vinyl, you can get CD, you can get a, a signed copy. So, and it's all there's all kinds of bundles with T-shirts, posters, and paraphernalia. And then the thing that's really been uh, a blast for us, and uh, the fans seem to be responding really well and enjoying themselves, is all the all the different fan engagement stuff. Yeah. So it's everything from you know, interviews, phone calls, we'll sing happy birthday to your boyfriend, you know, on and on and on and on. Um, and uh, yeah, like we discussed earlier in the interview, um, working with fans directly in some kind of musical capacity, sure. which a lot of that's been playing keyboards or singing or Eric and Tim playing instruments as well and singing on people's projects. Um, sometimes it's a whole bunch of songs. Sometimes they just have one song they'd like to do. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I've taught music lessons, piano lessons, singing lessons, all kinds of things that people have uh, purchased. And so it's been really, really fun and cool. And then when uh, we can all get back outside and hang out, you know, we go record shopping with people, uh, have lunch with them. People can buy all kinds of experiences and yeah, that so, sounds good. I might have to hit Tim up for one of those since we're both here. There you go. Anyway, you know. Oh, he he loved that. He's he's been teaching uh, guitar lessons to uh, uh, a young man whose mom purchased several lessons through our website. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, I just love to have him on the show. You know, he's got a really fascinating career as well. So, a absolutely. <laughs> so okay, um, the Moog Cookbook. You know, I was listening to this the other day. Did you guys just like crack up when you did recorded some of those parts? Like some of the things just when it, I heard them, it just, it made me just laugh out loud in a good way. Like, um, like the Lenny Kravitz tune that did it and do do, do do. It sounds so funny being played on a Seth like that. It just it cracked me up when I heard it. Um, and part of the joy of making those records was, you know, to be blunt, uh, taking the piss out of some of the very testosterone heavy rock uh, of the day. I mean, yeah. it, was at the height, it was at the height of grunge. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, although I was simultaneously in Imperial Drag at the time, um, it was just basically that whole project was born out of me and my partner Brian's frustration with so many of the music making entities, whether they're friends of ours or not had no interest in having keyboards on their recordings. It was considered uh, too light. It was going to uh, <clears throat> emasculate their music. Right. Yeah. Um, so we just decided to create some kind of project where we could make use of all these wonderful toys we were unearthing from yesteryear. Uh, weren't costing us much money. We, we enjoyed hunting and finding deals. Often we'd find things were broken and, Brian's a pretty good tech head and he would get them breathing again. And uh, so we said, well, what kind of project do we want to do if it's just the two of us screwing around for our own self amusement? And we were just inspired by all the covers albums from the sixties and seventies of with the original Moog synthesizer. Yeah. Like hooked on Bach and that kind of stuff. Right. So that's the premier one. And that record was surprisingly such a hit that it encouraged endless other people whose names you'll never know uh, to do covers albums, cover the Beatles. We cover the Rolling Stones. We cover the Beach Boys. We cover Burt Bacharach. And it's all beep, bump, bump, beep, bump, you know, um, and that in and of itself. Isn't there one by so a guy named Dick Hyman? Is that yeah. what he does? I thought so. Yeah. So he's, yeah. Dick Hyman was a brilliant uh, keyboardist arranger. He's arranged music for a lot of Woody Allen films. Um, he's a uh, primarily came from the jazz world. And at that time in his life, I guess he was fascinated as a lot of people were by the potential of electronic music. So he brought all of his brilliant talent and arranging skills and his, his schooling to this foreign freaked out experimental world. And those, the, those Dick Hyman records are just, I mean, they're masterpieces. You can't, you can't touch those things, man. They're, they inspired us so much. Uh, obviously we didn't have Moog modulars like, like he did, but um, we had plenty of other toys that we could, make sounds on so our whole thing was well they covered the hit parade 
when they came out in the '60s okay. and '70s. Yeah. Let's cover the hit parade now. And you know, the K Rocks at the time were playing the top ten of grunge and what have you. Uh, Pearl Jam, Lenny Kravitz, Soundgarden. And some of those bands we loved, some we didn't care for, it didn't matter. We we proceeded to apply our treatment to all of it and uh, just had a blast doing it. And and you're absolutely, I, I'd say, look, we knew we weren't going to make a single dime on this project. So one of the reasons we kept doing it is because we were making each other laugh so hard. It was just like we'd get together and, you know, instead of having a few beers and watching the game, we'd have a few uh, veggie tacos <laughs> and start recording um, these Moo Cookbook songs and just cracking each other up. Uh, and really, it, it really was fun to push some of these instruments to their full capacity and see what they could really do and how far we could take them. And, and half of them didn't even work half the time. So we'd get these crazy sounds out of them because they were broken. And it's not all just Moog. I mean, I heard some organ no. in there and other things. Yeah. Too. So it's whatever you needed. It's it. basically any, any vintage keyboards uh, of the, past 20 years and the drum machines that we were finding am I, am I right that the first volume was about grunge and then the second volume was more about 70s stuff yeah well it wasn't specifically about grunge the first album but that's what was on the airwaves a lot at the time mm -hmm. there's all kinds of other stuff on there um but uh yeah that's a, that's kind of what happens on the first album and then the second album we were very conscious that well, we discovered very early on with a lot of these records we were finding by people who were like, you know, the Moog synthesizer plays the hits of whatever, that one of the funniest things in the world to us is when you tried to play anything remotely bluesy on a synthesizer. <laughs> right. Just going up and down the blues scale can be a big disaster. It just, it just, it just evokes laughter. Sure. Um, and I can't tell you how many albums we came across where the guy's like i'm gonna rip a solo and it's like, <laughs> it just sounded it always sounded dumb and silly and uh so we realized that so much of our favorite uh the, the, the classic rock lexicon is, is as we were talking earlier it's all it's all born out of uh british blues sure so it's bu it's built in there mm -hmm. uh so we knew that there pretty much wasn't a song that we couldn't touch from the Leonard Skinner catalog and, and just all of the yeah, I mean, classics. Sweet Home Alabama. I mean, who saw that coming? That... Yeah, I mean, it's so it's so ripe for uh, messing with. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of my favorites was more than a feeling. It's like oh god, uh, it's like well, it comes in and you just think, oh, this is just kind of a synthy send up, and then you hit that da 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 dink 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 dink. But you're like, it's like Euro synth disco. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> to crack me up man it's... yeah that was a, that was a lot of fun um and uh i just have very very fond memories about that and then the, the funniest part about this story at all is that we got signed to this independent label here in la and we knew we knew that that meant that okay we probably have a few records in new york and chicago and th there would be some outreach beyond los angeles what we didn't expect was that the record was going to make it to Europe. And we started to get a lot of fans uh, from France and England, other music makers who they weren't, I mean, they were smiling, but they weren't laughing as much as us. They were just like, Oh my God, these guys are it's great. <laughs> you know, brought, yeah. This is, this is high art. They've brought back the synthesizers that we all remember from the sixties and blah, 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 blah. And uh, they, they were just laughing less. But the good news was they started offering remix projects to us. And uh, that's how we came to play with the band Air. Okay. They were fans of the Mood Cookbook. Ah, and yeah. we uh, began a dialogue with them. We did some remixes for them. And they said, you know, our record company, we're doing quite well. And our record company is just begging us to tour. But we're just two people. And we said, well, you're in Paris. Hire uh, some of your friends and go out on the road. He goes, and they said... French musicians are sheet. <laughs> Mared. <laughs> they, don't, they don't understand what we're doing. We can't hire them. And so me and Brian said, well, you should take us on the road and we'll be a four-piece a four keyboard band. And, and they got very excited by that concept. And they said, well, but we need bass and drums. And you know, and that's, that's when we brought in Justin from Beck's band on bass and Brian Reitzel, who 
I had just done the Logan Sanctuary. No, that was afterwards. Well, I knew we, we all knew Ryan Reitzel from Red Cross and some of our other sure favorite groups here in LA. And we had an instant backup band for them. Uh, and that's, that's how that whole thing happened. And, uh, but that all came from them being inspired by what we were doing in Moog Cookbook, which was just, that's just a flat out miracle. Well, we didn't know these people. They were on the other side of the planet. And yet at that same time, right, that first air record, and then obviously the subsequent ones, but the first air record is particularly groundbreaking. Uh, it comes out in 1998 and it's, uh, they're creating all these incredible keyboard sonic scapes uh, that of course have a nostalgic aspect to them, but they're very, very futuristic thinking as well. And, and, you know, it's a very, it's a very serious record. So uh, it was fun to see them uh, want to employ some, uh, in, inject some humor and lightheartedness into what they were doing. And they, they reached out to us. It was very flattering. Very cool. Well, that's really neat stuff. Have you ever met Michelle Moog? No. Is that Bob's daughter? I don't know her. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, Brian must have met her. My okay. partner. Yeah. Um, I met her. Well, you know, I used to attend and eventually I was on the staff of a festival called Northeast Art Rock Festival, Near Fest. Oh, okay. And uh, Michelle was there each year. And I remember one year they had, uh, have you ever seen the Moog guitar that they came out with? It's not, it's not the Liberation. I don't, think so. I don't remember that name, but it's probably about 10 years ago now. Really fancy looking, oh. almost like a Parker fly or some kind of weird. I know what you're talking about. I forgot, I forgot all about that. Yes. It's pretty neat, but I had the pleasure of carrying one around and having everybody at the festival sign it. Everybody that was on the bill and Amazing. they had like 12 bands. So it was a lot of people to round up. And you know what? I even signed it myself after dragging it around all weekend. <laughs> That's a fun <laughs> memento. Yeah. Why not? Um, quick question about Beck and then we'll wrap it up. Um, you got a favorite Beck album or any that rise to the top of the oh, pile God. for you? I'm sure you love them each for different reasons. I do. And, and he has covered so much territory. I, I, um, well, yeah, I, I would have to narrow it down to three. So, uh, o Odele, sure. Uh, that record before I joined and was introduced to any of those people, that record changed my life. Um, as, as much as any album has. Uh, it was so forward thinking and just, it really, it basically said to me, just when you thought you had this pop music thing figured out, he just, he just gave us a whole, a whole other, I was gonna say another room to, to a door to open, but sure. it was so much more than that. It was almost like a mansion <laughs> with, awesome. with 50 rooms in it. Um, I'm very, very proud of being involved in the album Sea Change, which is more of an acoustic band-based record. Yeah, that's one of the, in the last seven or eight years, I think, right? Yeah, it's 2001, 2002. Okay, okay. 10 years like now. Okay, yeah. yeah, it's been a while. Okay. Um, and that's just, I just, I'm such a fan of his songwriting on that album. And the, the mood that was created uh, by the band members um, that, that, that album has a very, has a very serious mood to it that I, I love uh, being immersed in when I listen to it. Uh, and then as recently as uh, Colors, which was two albums ago, okay. uh, which he intentionally played with very contemporary pop fare uh, and a lot of sounds and st uh, styles of pop songwriting of, you know, of the last decade or so. <clears throat> and um he teamed up with another mutual friend of ours, Greg Kirsten. They co-wrote that album. Uh, and I just think it's some of the best, catchiest mo modern pop commentary uh, ever. I mean, it's just, I just, it's uh, such, such, such mature songwriting, but it, it, yeah, it's very youthful and playful. And Were you in on it from like the demo phase or um... uh, the colors album actually, uh, I and I end up <laughs> my role on that record is very unique in that it's uh, I mostly just do a lot of singing. Oh wow! Okay, very nice. Yeah, so there's a lot of lot of backgrounds and and. Um, I'm just trying to back flush out. The kind of imagine thing. the look on your face as you're first listening to these songs, you know, and how excited yeah. you felt about yeah. what you heard. Well, him and him and Greg kind of went away for a while when we were off the road, and 
I knew they were riding, but I had no idea what was up his sleeve, where he was headed. And yeah, when I started first hearing some of the ideas he wanted to bring me in this thing back up on, I was, I was just like, I can't, I'm in awe of what you guys are going for here. It, it was just so inspiring and encouraging and, and uh, it just made me hopeful. It's been very uh, tempting to lose faith in a lot of modern music makers and, and uh, um, you know, so much uh, of what's been valued has not included uh, melody in recent years. Sure. And that's okay. Music's going to just keep going and evolving as it does, as particularly popular music is what I'm referring to. But, you know, that's never – melody is crucial for me in any genre sure. uh, that I, I, I have been drawn to. And, yeah, and like uh, A lot of modern stuff, they just kind of rap over it. Though. It's not really a melody at all. It's just kind of – No, it's not it's – not, that's, the, that's the point. It's, it's not it's, – that's not what's valued. Like I'm just um, going to yammer about my life and all the money I have or whatever. <laughs> well, there's that there, – you, yeah, you get, into the cult, you get into the cultural aspect of it. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, but just as purely in terms of mechanics and, and architecture, uh, there are some very basic ingredients that have been in popular music for decades, for centuries, uh, that gen new generations have basically said, hey, that's fine. I, I'm not interested in that. So it's, fall it's fallen away. Um, so to see him come out with an album like he did in 2018 like that, uh, that that adopted so many of those modern traits uh, but still had very strong melody content and hooks and very, very thoughtful arranging Yeah, um, was so exciting to me to even be a fly on the wall for. Sure. And just, it's rare to run across an album that has all of those elements in this day and age. You know? Exactly. That's great. Um, Johnny Cash, how did you, I read that you worked with him. How did that come about? Uh, well, I wished I had met him during those sessions. That that wasn't to be. Uh, those all came through Rick Rubin, who oh, was okay. uh, using me quite a bit at the time. And uh, he, that whole Johnny Cash retrospective and uh, all the new music that came out at that time was all Rick's idea, the way I understand it. And he really wanted to uh, work with Johnny and have him do recordings and capture, you know, his, what came to be his last artistic yeah. statements. Well, um, and I happened to uh, be there to play some of the keyboards on those records uh, through Rick's guidance. And um, uh, what, a, what an honor. Sure. Yeah. And that was, you know, Rick really brought out a great phase for him. You know, there's some really wonderful music in that period. Yeah. And it kind of set a, a standard that he, followed with other people like neil diamond later like let's just do this strip down thing no bells and whistles yeah let the song shine through you know and yeah i think he did that with some other people too although i'm not quite sure who but anyhow well what's next for you 2021 so far <laughs> um just trying to trying to keep the wonderful world that uh has come to me and that I've invested in uh, to keep it moving upward and onward. Uh, so I love and continue to love freelancing, uh, playing on other people's projects, whatever those might be, singing, keyboards, arranging. Um, uh, I continue to enjoy, you know, finishing what Licorice Quartet has set out to do. That's going to be a part of this year. Uh, and then, like I said, my solo EP, which is uh, nearing the finish line as well. Um, in addition to all those blessings, I look forward to uh, us being able to travel again. Sure. And uh, there's <laughs> there's a whole there's a whole other brilliant Beck record we didn't get a chance to promote because just as we were gearing up to do that, like a lot of people, mm -hmm. that all came to a grinding halt. Um, and that's another brilliant album of his that the world uh, barely got a taste of. So what's that? Which one's that? The, the hyperspace the, record. The hyperspace. That's right. Yeah. And you know, there there's some moments on there that whether Beck thinks of them this way or not, but they're they're quite, I don't want to say proggy, but they're very very moody and experimental and almost kind of ambient. Uh, they're very 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 textural. Uh, it's surprising these kind of journeys he takes the listener on, 
that are uh, these very um, artistic detours. Yet again, it's still sitting in a a context that could be on the radio. You know? Yeah. Well, I saw the one song you did <coughs> on Jimmy Fallon or one of those shows uh-huh. a little while back, and it was super catchy. What What are some of your favorite Beck tunes to play at you know at concerts live? Anything that mm. you just think, oh, good, it's time for this one. <laughs> Well, where it's at is always fun because that's a song that he's deliberately encouraged us all to, as well as himself, to stretch out on and improvise and take into a different territory every night uh, that we play it. Um, and it's always a crowd pleaser. Um, gosh, there, uh, uh, there's a there's a big dumb rocker called. Um, I forget the name now. <laughs> oh, E-Pro. Uh, that's so much fun to play, even though I don't even play any keyboards on it. <laughs> um, what else? Oh, there's so many. Well, um, a song called Dear Life, Off mm -hmm. of Colors. That's a really fun one. Lots of vocal harmonies to sing. Um, there's so many hats I get to wear in that group. Yeah. There's some songs I like. I don't play any keyboards, but I'm triggering all these crazy samples and sound effects and right. singing all these background vocals. And you're not and I don't even play the only keyboard player, right? There's like another keyboardist as well. So there's right? another gentleman who, uh, he, he wears just as many hats. He kind of grabs whatever needs to be filled in. Okay. So if there's extra keyboards, he'll do a little of that. He might play some banjo. He might, he plays a lot of like electronic percussion. Uh, he also sings background vocals. Uh, that's, that's Cal Campbell. And interestingly enough, it's Glenn Campbell's son. One of one of his sons. Uh -huh. Small world. Yeah. Um, so you're absolutely right. It's uh, that job does not get boring at all. Okay. It does not get uh, repetitive, and um, I'm very happy to be a part of that team and helping to bring that music to the audiences. Since we get to do that again, it seems like the perfect artist for you to be working with. You know, somebody that's uh, definitely, definitely, yeah, word in so many different ways. You know, I can't imagine you being happy in a stagnant situation at all. So it's great that it's always ever changing and absolutely even surprises you. I imagine sometimes it's like, wow, I didn't know he's going to go in this direction this time. Neat, <laughs> yeah. for sure. Roger. It's always a pleasure, my friend. Um, Good luck with volume two. Uh, I think it'll probably be in my mailbox when I go down there and look today. I think it's shipped this week. So, Cool, man. Yeah. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to catch up with you this way. And uh, thank you for so much airtime. Oh, yeah. Great for the group. Oh, it's always a great chat sitting, chatting with you. So thank you so much. All right. Mm -hmm. We'll give my best to everybody. I will be back tomorrow night at 10 p.m. I and my guest is Jeff Sipe, who is the drummer with the Aquarium Rescue Unit, which is a very popular jazz fusion inspired jam band down here in the South. Oh, all right. Yeah, really cool stuff. So, all right, Roger, we'll take care. Stay Thank safe. Thank you again. And I'll see you around. All right. Okay, thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye.